Hello, welcome back to my channel where we unpack, deconstruct, and try to make sense of all of the things we were taught growing up in fundamentalist, evangelical, or conservative Christian churches. My name is Christy, and today I'm going to be continuing in this series of reading through old Bible stories that we were taught growing up, you know, in Sunday school or in the pews, and see if we can kind of come to the same conclusions that we came to when we were younger, or the conclusions that we were taught we were supposed to come to about these stories. In my last video, I talked about Noah and the flood, and the time that God got so upset about how humanity turned out, the only way he could solve the problem is to reset everything by sending a world wide flood to kill out all of the animals and all of the people and you know hopefully repopulate the earth with that one family uh, so that everything would be great again but he realized that that probably wasn't the best plan he had to apologize with a rainbow in the sky he said I'll never do it again because you know what people are just wicked and that's just the way it is so I guess it's just not going to work and so today I want to kind of continue uh, the story into the Tower of Babel, which pretty much comes right after the flood. It's a very short story in Genesis 11, but I think there's a lot to unpack there. And I think the way they taught it to us in the church is so different than how I see it today when I read it. I am going to be reading the Bible at face value. I'm just going to open it up and read what it says and talk about it. And I do this for a very specific reason, because my channel exists to help people unpack and deconstruct from mostly the, the kind of fundamentalist view of, of these texts, okay? This is a, a literal interpretation to a lot of people. And so I read the Bible at face value for the people that are deconstructing from that specific kind of flavor of Christianity, because I really think it's important to deconstruct from the inside out uh, to kind of look at the beliefs you already hold and ask questions about those beliefs so that you can kind of pick it apart, scrutinize it, figure out what suits you, what doesn't, throw out the stuff that's not believable, and then you can kind of work to rebuild from there. I think that if people are telling us this is the inspired word of God meant for all people to read it and, you know, kind of come to know him and experience salvation, well, then it should be easily accessible for all people, especially people who might not have access to the resources and, um, you know, all of the things that, that people have to use in order to understand this very complicated text. If it is the inspired word of God, like a lot of people believe, we should be able to open the book and read it at face value and get what God is trying to tell us out of it. And if we can't, it kind of shows incompetency on God's part, in my opinion. So with that being said, let's jump into the Tower of Babel and read it. Keep in mind, uh, again, this is right after the flood. God drowns the entire earth. He has one family, one family to repopulate the entire earth together as a family. And this happens after, I guess, the, the earth has been repopulated. Now, it's important to note that God made sure to tell them to be fruitful and multiply, right? So make sure you, you you fill up the earth because I want a full earth and I'm God and it's all about me and what I want. So uh, he has told them to be fruitful and multiply and then this happens. Starting in uh, 11 verse 1. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, Shinar, I looked it up because uh, I usually have to look these up to, to make sure I'm pronouncing things correctly. And, and I have gotten both Shinar and Shinar. Uh, so I have no idea how to pronounce this. Feel free to correct me in the comments. We're going to call it Shinar. Shinar. So the whole world had one language and a common speech. Now I will say that if you are God and you want everyone to be peaceful and work together, then you're probably going to want to give them one language so that they're not confused and they can kind of work together, especially back before they had any way to translate, <laughs> you know, between each other. However, I can really appreciate the fact that we live in a world that has so many cultures and languages and, and differences in how we say things and express ourselves. You know, some cultures have words that don't even exist. You know, there's, there's no alternative word that exists in, in the other languages. They, there, there are cultures and languages that have words to describe things we don't even know how to describe in our own language. I think that's fascinating. Uh, my husband and I lived in Costa Rica for a year and there was a big language barrier there, though we were learning Spanish while we lived there. We were very far behind, very, you know, um, amateur in our Spanish speaking abilities. And so we had a lot of language barriers, but it really made for some, some interesting conversations. It made for some really rich experiences. We were just kind of trying to figure out what the other person was saying and using hand gestures and, and picking up on words and teaching one another each other's language. I always really enjoyed those experiences. So I can truly appreciate the, the, the difference and cultures and languages between all of the people on earth 
However, if you are God and you want everyone to work together, then yeah, you probably want them all to speak one language. Verse three, they said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So see a group of people that instead of being violent and wicked and and awful like they were pre-flood apparently they seem to be doing pretty well they seem to be thriving they seem to be working together to be uh, kind of working as one group building a society and then they say to each other you know what let's let's really kind of cement ourselves here let's make a name for ourselves let's build a tower let's reach up to the sky let's make a huge tower and let's just live on a city in the clouds when i read that you know i'm thinking they seem to be doing okay it seems like the the plan worked right god's god's whole plan to flood the earth and reset humanity it seemed to work because they're they're working together they're coming together to create a plan they're unified that seems like they're living in peace to me it seems like what god would want right you think about these Bible stories, you know, that you were taught when you were younger, you don't really tend to remember all the details, probably because they didn't preach all of the details. You just remember the, the moral of the story, the lesson, you know, there. And I remember for me, the lesson of Babel was that society was just so evil and wicked and they wanted to, to be God and they wanted to be better than God. And so they were building a tower so they could reach up to the heavens and they could, you know, proclaim themselves as their own gods. I don't read that here, <laughs> you know? Like, I think when it says that reaches the heavens, I think that they just wanted a really tall tower, you know, uh, the heavens, the sky. I don't think they were trying to, to build a tower to, to, to go into the sky and to be God. It doesn't even say that here. It's crazy how we are taught that, you know, in the church, that they just wanted to, to be gods. They wanted to be their own gods or they wanted to be better than God. They were just so evil and wicked when nothing about the text implies that whatsoever. It just says that they came together, they worked together, they wanted to build a city and a tower, and they wanted to make a name for themselves, which is, I kind of think, what most of us want, right? Most people that exist want to kind of make a name for themselves, kind of cement themselves and their legacy. So I don't really know what's so bad about that. Verse 5, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord came down. I guess he's uh, he's still walking the earth like he did in Adam and Eve. I think it's interesting he stopped doing that at some point. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Who is us? Who is God talking to? Now, if you ask the modern evangelical Christian, they're probably going to tell you, well, the members of the Trinity, of course. He's talking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. That's who us is. It's obvious. <laughs> but that does not continue throughout the Old Testament scriptures. If you notice in the very earliest books of the Bible, it's, it's us. Let us do this. Let us you know, go down and confuse their language. Uh, they have become like us in, in Adam and Eve. So God is talking to someone else, uh, which really leads me to believe there was um, kind of a polytheistic nature of this God in the earliest days. And then over time, as the writers were writing about this God and the religion was developing, it turned into a religion of monotheism. If God was talking to the members of the Trinity, why did that not continue uh, throughout the Old Testament? You know, it kind of goes from God being this not so all powerful, omniscient, uh, you know, number one <laughs> soul God. Uh, it goes from that to I am the God Almighty. I'm the one true God, all powerful, almighty. And so I, I really think that if you sit down and you read the scriptures and look at this God character from, from the beginning to the end of the Old Testament, you're probably going to see a big change um, and, a, and evolving in this character of God. And it kind of makes sense if you have a God concept that is you know, uh, being presented over thousands of years and passed down, uh, you know, people are going to change how they see God. You know, up until now, Jesus looks very different than he did back in the earliest days of Christianity. These concepts evolve over time. It's just kind of obvious and evident that that's what's happening here. Um, but it says, it's as if people are speaking the same language, they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. I think that's really interesting. So, 
people have the the power and the ability to do anything they want to do but god wants to limit them he doesn't want them to be able to do anything they want to do he doesn't want them building a tower to the heavens and it, it's crazy because again we were taught that god came down and he 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 was angry about what they were doing because they were trying to overtake heaven or they were trying to be like god themselves but that's not what god says in this passage it says look at what they've done they've built this tower they're, they're capable of doing this they can do anything nothing will be impossible for them which is interesting because in the new testament jesus tells his disciples that if they have the faith of a mustard seed that they will be able to move mountains and nothing will be impossible for them so when jesus says it it's a good thing you can do all things nothing's impossible for you but for some reason at this time god doesn't want all things to be possible for human beings because god is still trying to control them he wants to to decide the narrative he wants to decide what happens to these people how they he's, he's playing sims and he's he's you know controlling what they do and where they go and when they don't act right he's deciding to just kind of wipe it out and restart um or, or cause some kind of chaos so that he can make things go according to his own plan it's always about god and what god wants in his own plan and i really love kind of exploring this idea of this god that creates humanity just so he can do whatever he wants with them and sure, you know, we, we create sins. You know, I play the sins a lot. We play, we create sins and we do whatever we want with them. We have fun with them and do silly things. But I think to a lot of us, we realize that these sins are just, you know, they're, they're numbers, they're numbers in a, in a computer. Um, they're not actual real people with human being, you know, with human feelings and emotions. And so if I'm God and I, I create human beings that I know are sentient and have emotions and feelings, I think the most ethical thing I could do is just let them be. If I created them, I'm going to just let them be. You know, I'm not going to force them to be anything that I want them to be. And if I am, then I'm not being very ethical, in my opinion. Now, that's just my opinion. There are lots of Christians out there that say, well, he's God and he can do whatever he wants. He created us. Well, that's fine. Yeah. If, if he's all powerful and he created us, he can do whatever he wants. Yeah, sure. I don't have to consider him ethical for that or good. And I don't have to consider that he's worthy of worship for that. He doesn't want anything to be possible for them. He is angry that they have been able to come together, to work together, to work in peace and unity. And they're no longer these evil, wicked giants that they were before, but God is still unsatisfied. He's still unhappy. And isn't that just <laughs> the theme of, of Christianity and the Bible? That over and over and over again, God is so unhappy with the things the human beings are doing. Even when they are living in peace and harmony and working together to build cities and to cement a legacy, even when they're doing the best possible thing, he's still upset because they're not doing the thing he wants them to do. And it really paints a picture of the Bible being a very effective tool for oppression and control if you can believe that it's perfectly fine that, you know, God creates people and then wants to, to use them like dolls. And, and he wants them to do what he wants them to do rather than what they want to do. Even when they're being good. Even when they're acting in a way that is not wicked and evil, you know. Um, and they're just building cities. He's upset because they're not doing what he wants them to do. Come, let us go down. Let's confuse their language. They will not understand each other. That is so cruel. That's, that's so incredibly cruel. And again, like I said, language is great. I love that we have all these different languages, but you have a, a society that is working together and, and probably considering one another family and you've decided that you don't like what they're doing. So you're just going to confuse their language and then they won't be able to communicate with one another. They won't be able to accomplish the thing they were trying to accomplish. And then you want them to scatter out into the world. You're literally trying to divide families. That makes no sense to me. Why are you doing that, God? That's very, that's, that's very immature. <laughs> and so verse eight, the Lord scattered them from all over the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. When I read apologetic responses, gotquestions.org, uh, they explain that, you know, God told them to be fruitful and multiply and they did not. And so he had to force them into it. Because, you know, God is all about freedom. <laughs> he's all about freedom until he's not. And I think that he's not most of the time, if not all of the time. And obviously, to me now, the story is just mythology. It's a way to explain how languages came about. It, it's not a historical account whatsoever. This did not actually happen. But it's really important to pay attention 
to how this story is being presented because I think how a biblical story is presented by a church, by a pastor, tells you a lot about the intentions of that church and the pastor, if you know what I mean. If they are telling you that, you know, this story is just such a, a picture of evil, wicked humans and how, you know, human beings don't listen to God and they get what they deserve. And because they didn't, they weren't fruitful and multiplying, they, they deserve to just be scattered out and to have their, their, their building just completely abandoned. What is that? What is the lesson there? What is he trying to get you to do as a, as a, as a person who's in his church? If he's telling you that that's the way the story went, when it's not. They, they, they add to the story so much. They twist it so much. They interpret it in a way that, that really pushes a narrative that you don't get to have your own life, your own plan. You don't get to, to be happy and thrive without God. You just don't. You're going to suffer the consequences no matter what. You have to obey. You have to listen. You have to do whatever God says, which conveniently is also whatever the pastor says because the pastor speaks for God. He is a man of God and he has been inspired by God to get up on the, the pulpit and to tell you God's message. Every pastor that gets on a pulpit is pretending to speak for God and saying that God called me to do this. God is telling me this and I'm telling you what God is telling me. And so pay attention, pay attention to how they, they spin this, how they convey it and the lesson that they want you to get out of it because it's usually very different from the lesson you might get out of it if you, you know, read it on your own. I, I'm convinced that a lot of biblical writings were authored by people that didn't necessarily worship this God or believe that it was a good God, but were just writing stories, you know, like mythological stories, not taking a stance on the morality of it all, but just kind of, por you know, portraying a story. If you read this story and you just kind of read it at face value, it does not look like God is the good guy. It looks like God is very controlling. He is very immature, he's angry, he's upset that people are thriving and doing well and working together in unity and peace without him. And that's what he doesn't like. He doesn't like that they are able to do things without him. I mean, they say without God, we can do nothing, but yet God admits in this text that they were without him, they weren't abiding by his rules and they were doing just fine without him. So it's a very clear picture of what happens when people don't follow God and it seems like they do pretty well for themselves but think about how often the church and members of the church don't care if you are happy and thriving outside of the church walls think about how often people leave and say I have found peace I have found happiness I have found my my true authentic path and they say it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how you feel it doesn't matter if you feel happy without God if you don't have God you have nothing and he will punish you for that and that, to me, that's what the story tells it, it, when it's being presented in the churches. That's the message they're, they're trying to give you. We don't care if you're happy and thriving without God. You need to obey. You need to listen. Otherwise, you might suffer the consequences. You will suffer the consequences and you will deserve it. I don't think that's a very healthy message. I really don't. I don't know. Maybe you do. Maybe you see the story differently. You might have your own interpretation of, of, of it, of what it's trying to convey. And sure, if we consider the historical context and the, you know, the ancient language and the interpretations and we try to read the original language it was written in, maybe we might get a different story. But the fact that God would require you to do all of that in order to understand his word seems thoughtless, thoughtless and kind of heartless on his part. Because not everybody has access to those things. Not everybody is capable of, of looking that up. Um, and think about think about all of the the study one would have to do just to unpack this story and learn about what could be the the true interpretation. And there's going to be a lot of people that disagree. There are a lot of people that disagree. If you look up the story, you know, between the denominations, also within you know Jewish culture, which is this is a Jewish text. It's not even a Christian text, but of course, you know, Christians have appropriated and claimed it as their own, and now present it as their own, and then they twist it and they give a, a story, a narrative that really presents a God of of, of fear and control and anger and um, a God that does not care about the well-being of human beings. He only cares about making sure that his agenda is fulfilled because, you know, to him, this is just a game and he wants it to go his way. And if it doesn't, he's going to get very angry. Go figure. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. Uh, that's the end of the Tower of Babel. Such an interesting reading because when you read it from someone who is no longer in it, it 
it tells a very different story and you come to very different conclusions and I, that's the point right that's the point thanks for joining me in this reading and this kind of atheist sunday school that we're doing <laughs> and um if you want to you can follow me on tiktok at christy.burke it's where i share a lot of my hot takes i'll link it in my description as well as my merch shop jezebelvibes.com shop and uh, i'll see you next time